Thank you. Some people look to history and tradition to tell them what is right and wrong, good and bad. What was good for their fathers and their fathers' fathers is good enough for them. But we are gathered here as objectivists, committed to an ideal of reason and human freedom that has never been fully realized. Tradition is not our standard, and history, from an objectivist perspective, is full of things that went wrong or weren't good enough. And this is not just a matter of subjective preference. We are objectively correct that there is a standard of right and wrong. That standard is not defined by history. And yet I stand here today to celebrate and to ask you to celebrate something that happened 800 years ago this week in a meadow called Runnymede, where on June 15th, 1215, King John of England set his seal to Magna Carta. To say whether a tradition or an historical moment is good or bad, we need to do the same thing we would do in any other case. Is this computer good? Is my speech good? We need to identify it and hold it up to the standard that does tell us whether a thing is good or bad. That means asking, does it support the life of man qua man? Does it support the political principles that enable human beings to live and flourish in society? The principles of individual rights. What I intend to show today is that Magna Carta and the legal principles and tradition for which it stands are indeed great values. The English history I'll be recounting, and recounting rather quickly, comes mainly from Bernard Schwartz's book, The Roots of Freedom, which tells England's constitutional history from the perspective of an American lawyer. To understand Magna Carta in its original context, we need to understand the basics of feudalism. A feudal society was one based on relationships between lords and their men. If you were some lord's man, that meant you held land, quote unquote, of him. That entailed a number of obligations, most notably, that he was to protect you with force, and you were to fight for him. The service you owed to your lord was defined and limited by custom and by agreement, and eventually tended to be replaced with payments of money, on the ground that this way the lord could hire someone to take your place. If either side failed to hold up his end of the bargain, the other party was not obliged to put up with it. He could declare the relationship at an end, or even force the other party to comply. Magna Carta was not the first charter of liberties issued by an English monarch. There had been others, particularly by kings whose legal claim to the throne was dubious or non-existent. The king who granted Magna Carta was King John, whose claim was not dubious. Like his brother Richard I before him, John imposed burdensome taxes. He also interfered in other ways. For some reason, there's actually a record that a woman promised him 200 chickens in exchange for being allowed to spend one night with her husband. But of course, if John had been a wonderful monarch, no one would have felt the need to force him to issue Magna Carta. It's really the bad kings who give rise to the tradition of liberty. Not that that's their goal, of course, but they make it necessary for other people to make it their goal. And in the years leading up to 1215, most of the armed men of the kingdom rose against King John. At first, they wanted to kill him and make someone else king, but eventually they decided to demand a charter of liberties instead. So John didn't have much of a choice. If he wanted to restore peace, stay king, maybe even alive, he had to, pretty, to do pretty much what was demanded. So what were the key provisions of Magna Carta? Clause or chapter 12 is probably the most important, or one of the most important. Scottage and aid are some of those feudal payments that people made to their lords 
And what this clause is basically saying is, except in a few very limited cases, the king will not impose them without consulting his subjects. This is, in rudimentary form, the principle of no taxation without representation. And it is that principle from which, as we will see, the power of parliament grew. And here are my favorites. No free man shall be in any way destroyed, nor will we go against him or send against him, save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell. To no one will we deny or delay right or justice. This is what evolved into our constitutional right to due process of law. To say that the lawful judgment of his peers means trial by jury is an anachronism, but only a slight one. Juries as we know them didn't exist in 1215, but by the end of the next century, this clause was understood as protecting the right to a trial by jury. So what did Clause 39 require in 1215? Trials had to be in some form that was recognized as legal. At the time, that could even be trial by combat. But one thing it couldn't be was the arbitrary decree of the king. Clauses 39 and 45 stand for the rule of law. And it's important to note what law. The law of the land, or of the realm. That is to say, man's law, not some god's law, and also not merely philosophical principles. Now the content of this law is not, for the most part, spelled out in Magna Carta, although some of it is. There is an assumption that the law already exists. And these provisions mean that the king himself and his officers are bound by it. And if those provisions, not to mention the fact that King John was being forced to issue Magna Carta, don't make clear that Magna Carta places the law over the king, consider this. Chapter 61 contains an elaborate provision for enforcing it. Now, that method, detailed in Chapter 61, is ne was never actually carried out. But the principle is plainly there. This is law that is meant to be enforced, even against the king. Was this completely original? No. The king was a lord, and the idea that lords could be compelled to observe their duties to their men was already familiar. That's what the barons were doing. But Magna Carta put limits on royal authority into writing, and it became the symbol of the idea that royal authority was, and could be, limited. So, June 15th, 1215, John issues Magna Carta, and from then on, England has parliaments and jury trials, and no. The history of liberty does not run that smoothly. It doesn't run smoothly at all. In fact, the original grant of Magna Carta lasts, if at all, through August 24th, 1215, a whole two months and change. Then Pope Innocent III annuls it. But then in 1216, King John dies, and Henry III takes the throne at the age of nine. In 1217, the young king, or more accurately those acting in his name, reissues Magna Carta. He confirms it again in 1225 in exchange for a subsidy, and that version is placed at the beginning of the published collection of English statutes. Nevertheless, King Henry tended to disobey it, if he thought he could get away with it. And yet, King Henry III did call parliaments to ask for money, just as Magna Carta envisioned. And by the end of the 13th century, elected commoners, as well as nobles, were being summoned to participate in parliament. By 1301, Magna Carta had been confirmed at least 15 times, and been proclaimed throughout the realm in its original Latin and sometimes in English, too. In the 14th century, kings often called parliaments because they needed money, and it became customary for the grants to be conditional and for the conditions to be the basis of statutes. There was a statute in 1331, actually a little bit before that custom was firmly established, 
prohibiting certain punishments against the form of the Great Charter and the law of the land. So at least by this point, we see the Charter, originally called great because it's big, taking on its greatness as an anchor of liberty. In 1354, we first see the phrase due process of law. In 1399, Richard II, who had insisted that the law was in the mouth of the king, as the saying goes, that is to say that the king could change it whenever, however he wanted, is deposed by vote of parliament and force of arms. In, in 1407, Henry IV tries asking the lords to determine how much money is needed for defense. The House of Commons protests that they should have been asked first, and the king conceded the point. We also see in this period a transition in how statutes are made. The custom had been that Parliament would ask for certain things, and after they went home, the king would write the statute. But now, Parliament starts writing the statutes, and the king merely approves them. Fast forward just a little to the era of Lord Edward Cook. Yes, it's pronounced Cook. He came of age under Elizabeth I and rose to be her attorney general. But then the Virgin Queen failed to leave an heir, and James VI of Scotland came down to England as James I. James I holds that the king is absolute and comparable to God. Nevertheless, he puts Lord Cook in two of England's highest judicial jobs. On November 13, 1608, he summons his judges and gets into a confrontation with Lord Cook. The king says, I may judge any case myself in any court. Lord Cook says, the king cannot judge any case. It must be judged in a court according to law. The king says that he thought the law was founded upon reason, and he, as well as other men, had reason. To which Lord Cook says, well, you have natural reason, but cases are to be judged by the artificial reason of the law, which takes a lot of study to master. Says the king, this means that I shall be under the law, which it is treason to affirm. Lord Cook says, not I, but Bracton saith, rex non debet esse sub homines et sub deo et lege. The king ought not to be under man, but under God and the law. Who wins this confrontation? Well, if you were there at the time, you might have said the king. He makes a fist and Lord Cook throws himself on the floor. But the verdict of history is with Lord Cook, perhaps because he wrote it. <laughs> Lord Cook's law books were still used when men such as Mr. Jefferson were studying. In 1625, Charles I takes the throne. He too believes in the supremacy of the king. And he tries to evade Parliament's authority over taxation with a forced loan. Five knights refuse to pay and they get imprisoned. Now the Crown doesn't actually try to defend in court the idea that it could impose a forced loan. Instead, it claims that the king may detain a subject indefinitely as long as it's own, by his own special command. And that that's what's happening in this case. Lord Chief Justice Hyde rules for the king. Yes, the king can detain someone indefinitely on his own order. Does the king win? Well, in 1628, we see the petition of right. It relies on Magna Carta and its echoes, and it is suggested by Lord Cook to clarify Magna Carta and respond to the Five Knights case. It objects to taxes and forced loans imposed by royal prerogative without the consent of Parliament. It objects to imprisonment, execution, and other harassment without due process. The House of Lords says, Wait a second, let's add a clause saying you know, this doesn't affect the sovereign power of the king. To which Lord Cook replies, Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign. 
I wonder this sovereign was not in Magna Carta. The lords don't get their amendment. And the king tries to avoid assenting to the petition of right, but ultimately he yields. And then he ignores it, incarcerates some members of parliament. Eventually, Lord Cook dies. So does Charles I, rather dramatically. Parliament cuts off his head. And at a brief attempt at a republic, or perhaps I should say a dictatorship, Charles II is invited back in 1660. 1670, William Penn is locked out of a church, so he preaches in the street. He's put on trial for this, and, and he invokes Magna Carta. The trial is well worth reading, it's hilarious. Seriously. But after the trial, the jury comes in and Edward Bushell, the foreman, says Penn and his co-defendant are guilty of speaking in Grace Church Street, but refuses to say in breach of the peace. Now, speaking in Grace Church Street, if it's not in breach of the peace, is not a crime. This is not a proper verdict. The court insists on a proper verdict. And ultimately, Bushell comes in and says, not guilty. So Penn is released, and the jury is fined and locked up for returning a verdict contrary to law. <laughs> then in Bushell's case, the higher court says there can be no jury verdict contrary to law, so the jury can't be punished for returning a verdict contrary to law. In 1685, James II takes the throne and uses the power of indulgence, which is something like the pardon power, to protect Catholics, who at this time were subject to legal persecution by acts of parliament. He even issues a declaration of indulgence, suspending all the laws for persecution of the Catholics, and he orders the bishops to read it. This is a challenge to the authority of parliament. The bishops petition, or some of the bishops petition, not to read the, the proclamation. And King James calls this seditious, puts them on trial. The jury acquits them, and the very day the jury acquits them, the political parties send out an invitation, hey, William of Orange, come be King of England. This is the glorious revolution of 1688. Parliament is so firmly established that there doesn't even have to be a war. In 1689, with the English Bill of Rights, Parliament explains why James II was deposed. And the grievances included taxing without Parliament and also excessive fines, which are mentioned in Magna Carta too. And now Parliament is firmly in charge. Also published in, second, in 1689, John Locke's Second Treatise of Government. And that, and that brings us to the developments of George I and George II. George I and George II were not very interested in governing England. George I didn't even speak English. So government became the business of the ministers who were answerable to the House of Commons. By the time George III took the throne, the idea of the king as actually ruling is dead, and he cannot revive it. So, over to the Americas. The Charter of Virginia of 1606, written at least in part by Lord Cook, seems to say that Virginians shall have all the rights of Englishmen. The frame of government of Pennsylvania a proprietary colony granted to a man who had some reason to appreciate Magna Carta and trial by jury, promises trial by jury. William Penn also sponsors the first publication of Magna Carta in the New World. In the preface, he writes, in France and other nations, the mere will of the prince is law. His word takes off any man's head, imposeth taxes, etc. Not so in England, said Penn. And this is what made Englishmen unique. Virginia and Pennsylvania are not the only colonies with an interest in liberty or Magna Carta. Several past assertions of rights, at least some of which drew on Magna Carta. 
Jump forward to the time when, says John Adams, then and there was the child independence born. It was a search and seizure case. The writs of assistance authorized customs inspectors to search any place where they thought goods might be concealed. But indirectly, it was a case about smuggling. That was what the inspectors were trying to stop. But smuggling was a big part of Boston's economy. James Otis argued that if the acts of trade were considered as revenue laws, as they had been only recently, they destroyed the security of life, liberty, and property. And in opposition to this, he invokes both philosophy and English liberty. Here's another case where if he were there at the moment, you might say Otis lost. But he wins in that the case tends to be cited as the inspiration for the Fourth Amendment. And to that extent, we have here the Fourth Amendment springing from Magna Carta. Another problem in this period was that smuggling cases were being prosecuted in the Admiralty Courts. In the Admiralty Courts, you don't get a jury. Why were the cases in Admiralty Court? Because customs officials thought it was impossible to enforce anti-smuggling laws before American juries. So what do we have here? Taxation without representation and taxation enforced without juries. Echoes of the Five Knights cases, echoes of the principles of Magna Carta. With the Stamp Act in 1765, we get more taxation without representation. There's a great deal of protest. The Stamp Act is repealed in 1766. And at the same time, Parliament passes the Declaratory Act, claiming the right to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. But Benjamin Franklin warns Parliament that the Americans would, would erase our resolutions against the Stamp Act only if militarily forced to. In 1773, again, over the issue of taxation without representation, we get the Boston Tea Party, which is punished with the Intolerable Acts of 1774, closing the port of Boston, providing for the quartering of troops, expanding Quebec, and restoring French-style civil law in Quebec, which had been being governed by an English administrator. And that brings us to the First Continental Congress, which sent petitions to the king, set a date for the con Second Continental Congress. But before the Second Continental Congress convened, came the battles of Lexington and Concord, April 19th, 1775. The following month, the Second Continental Congress convenes. The Second Continental Congress, of course, passes the Declaration of Independence. There's been some debate online lately as to whether the Declaration is founded on universal principles or on the heritage of English law. To this, my answer is false dichotomy. It's founded on both. The fundamental principles of the Declaration are philosophical. Mr. Jefferson summarizes Locke. But the notion that Locke, writing in the year of the English Bill of Rights and providing a philosophical argument for taxation only by representatives and the idea that rulers should be under the law, has nothing whatsoever to do with Magna Carta and the legal tradition that descends from it is not exactly plausible. <laughs> Beyond that, the specific grievances that comprise the bulk of the Declaration draw in several places on Magna Carta. For example, well, I'll list the places I've spotted. One, the king is accused of having refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good, a complaint that may refer to affirmations of Magna Carta. The complaint against imposing taxes on us without our consent has roots in both philosophy and Magna Carta. The complaint against depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury only sounds in Magna Carta and the legal tradition. 
We do not get an argument for that in Locke. And of course, the, the complaint about Quebec emphasizes the association of English laws with liberty. Skip forward not that many years to the U.S. Constitution. The very idea of a Constitution, as we think of it, includes the idea of written law that is over the government and constrains it. Clearly, one source for that that's familiar to the framers is the tradition of Magna Carta. They also had experience with the colonial charters. The Constitution provides that tax bills must come from the House, which is directly elected, and not from the Senate, which under the original Constitution was not. When the Bill of Rights is added, we get an addition of the right to trial by jury in the Sixth Amendment, and the Due Process Clause in the Fifth Amendment. Later, the same idea is added again in the following century with the Fourteenth Amendment. Okay, move on to philosophy. The orthodox view of taxes among objectivists and libertarians is that it violates people's rights to force them to pay taxes. It's initiating force. It means that government officials gain value from productive people without consent, in violation of the trader principle. And yet it is the standard objectivist view that we do need government. We need government because private parties and foreign enemies may seek to violate our rights. And we need laws, police, and armed forces to protect us. We need government to resolve disputes about rights. The government we need to do these things is much smaller and simpler and cheaper than what we have now. We need the military, the police, and the courts. But we do need those few things, and they do cost money. Given that government is expensive, can people be brought to pay for it voluntarily? Perhaps so. I'm not going to say that this is impossible. But the history of England we've just been over is at least some evidence to the contrary. The kings wanted to who wanted to avoid calling parliaments by avoiding imposing taxes never did find a sustainable way to do that. So there's at least some reason, and I emphasize some reason this has not been proved, to think that we need a system of taxation, a system that forces people to pay for the government without which they'd be vulnerable to criminals and invaders. Again, not proven, but some reason. And in any event, it doesn't seem likely we're getting rid of it anytime soon. But if the power to tax isn't limited, none of our property will be secure. If unaccountable officials can just take whatever they want, they'll plunder us and we'll have no way to stop them. The principle that taxes may be imposed only by representatives is an attempt to split the difference between voluntary payments and forced taxes by creating a system where we can be forced to pay taxes, but we have some control over the taxes. This way, the power to tax is limited, and the taxpayers have, at least in theory, some protection. For one thing, the representatives are taxpayers themselves, so they're taking their own money. And the other is that the representatives are accountable to the taxpayers come election day. Now, history and the federal budget show that this is an imperfect system. Representatives may not share your priorities. They may be able to tax you more than they tax themselves and their supporters. So I'm certainly not going to say the principle of representation perfectly controls taxes. Far from it. But to my knowledge, nothing has better has been devised to control taxes except making all payments voluntary. And it's not clear that that can meet our need for government. Now, of course, one other way of limiting taxes is to limit government's activities. 
If the government can't subsidize the poor on one hand and the connected rich on the other, then it won't tax us in order to do so. But limiting the functions of government doesn't control how much it spends on those functions that it is allowed to perform. It doesn't limit how well it pays its own officials. It only helps somewhat to limit the cost of the military. So even if we can limit the government's functions, unless we can eliminate taxation altogether, the principle of no taxation without representation is still valuable. Let's move on to the right to a trial, which is also supported by the tradition of Magna Carta, and which is the main issue I'm working on right now with the Center for the Individual. I have two main arguments for this. The first is what I call the argument from truth. It begins by noting that we need the government to protect our rights against criminals, to stop our fellow citizens from murdering, robbing, or raping us. And one key way to protect us from criminals is to punish criminals. But any system that's set up to punish criminals risks punishing the innocent, and will sometimes do so. Sometimes it'll be because officials acting in good faith makes mista make mistakes. Sometimes it may be because they deliberately hurt, set out to hurt somebody. And sometimes it may be just by cutting corners, by being so eager to get a conviction that they're reckless as to whether the person's actually guilty. Yet when the government punishes the innocent, it does things that either are rights violations or would be if they were done by private citizens. It causes the kinds of harm that we want it to prevent. So we need a system designed to punish the guilty, but not to punish the innocent. Punishing the people who actually do commit crimes and not punishing the people who don't may seem like conflicting values. And in some respects, they do conflict. But they are both a matter of finding truth. When the government, sets at, when the government finds the truth of a case and acts accordingly, it either punishes, an innocent, uh, punishes a guilty person or refrains from punishing an innocent person. And this is one of the senses in which we need the law to be objective. We need it to be enforced objectively through a process of determining whether a person ha has actually broken the law and punishing only those who are duly proved guilty. And at least where we're talking about the laws that prohibit rights violations, both punishing the guilty and not punishing the innocent are aspects of securing our rights. Punishing the guilty makes our rights secure because it deters private parties from violating our rights. Not punishing the innocent makes our rights secure because it means that so long as we obey the law, we won't be deprived of life, liberty, or property as a matter of criminal punishment. So there needs to be a system in place to find the truth. And an adversarial process may be the best possible way. The defendant has an incentive to make his best case, to find the evidence and the arguments that show that he is innocent, or at least that the prosecution's evidence and argument aren't sufficient to convict him. And the adversarial process gives him the chance to do this. At least, that's how it's supposed to work. The second argument is the argument from action. You need to be able to act to gain and keep your values, and rights are rights to do that. When you've been accused of a crime, acting to keep your values, the liberty, property, and perhaps even life that you would lose if convicted, means defending yourself in some way. But you can't have a right to defend yourself physically, to fight the police, or to break out of jail. That would make the system ineffective at protecting our rights against criminals. So there has to be a right to defend yourself intellectually, to make the argument to a suitable arbiter that you are not guilty of the crime of which you've been accused, or to show that the case against you isn't good enough to justify the conclusion that you're guilty. Otherwise, we'd be helpless in the face of accusations, including false accusations. So, there should be a trial. But why a trial by jury? 
One argument that's been made is that it's harder to fool a group of people who must reach a unanimous conclusion than to fool a single judge. But the people I've been talking about today were more concerned with oppression than with simple mistakes. And being judged by a jury means getting the judgment of, in Magna Carta's terms, your peers, of people, as the Supreme Court put it in 1880, who have the same legal status in society as that which you hold. What the government does to you, your peers know could happen to them. So they have an incentive to stop the government from violating your rights. That might mean refusing to convict you of violating an unjust law. It might mean not believing the police, if the police develop a reputation for lying to get convictions. It might simply mean taking very seriously the idea that the defendant must be presumed innocent and that the prosecution must be held to a very strict standard of proof, not just trusted because the prosecutor is an old familiar colleague or because the judge is a former prosecutor. Anything the government does that endangers the rest of us, when the rest of us are on the jury, we can protect you from. A judge might expect special treatment if he's ever accused. But a juror can't. The government has been working for years to weaken the right to a trial. The federal government now gets about 97% of its convictions from plea bargains, which it sometimes gets by threatening stiff penalties for insisting on a trial. It presents the testimony of cooperating witnesses, witnesses whose cooperation with the prosecution is keeping them out of prison or getting them out sooner. And governments try to stop jurors from refusing to enforce unjust laws. The most important idea that Magna Carta stands for, however, is not any particular legal principle, but the principle of the supremacy of the law. Here, says Winston Churchill, is a law which is above the king and which even he must not break. This reaffirmation of a supreme law and its expression in a general ch charter is the great work of Magna Carta, and this alone justifies the respect in which men have held it. Magna Carta means that we can say to anyone, even to a king, you may not do that. It's against the law. Having the rule of law means that there are publicly known and accepted rules, principles, and standards that bind everyone, including all officials, even the president, and even judges. The rule of law exists to the extent that we can expect them to obey the law, that we can expect them to hold themselves to a legal standard, that we can expect that to any given, for any given official, there are other people who will make that person obey the law. Indeed, my tentative definition of law is rules controlling the action of coercive authorities that enable those subject to those authorities to rely on them in choosing their own actions. The law governs us and the law protects us because we can rely on it to control them. Perhaps most importantly and most essentially, the rule of law is the subordination of power to reason. To borrow Rand's words in a related context, the separation of force and whim. The people who hold the guns must obey the people who listen to arguments. And even the judges must rule according to reason, not according to whim. And yet we need to remember here something Lord Cook said to King James. The law is not every man's natural reason, but an artificial reason, a mode of thinking about the case before you, shaped by the law that has already been laid down. Part of being a society with the rule of law is that the law tells us who gets to make governmental decisions, including decisions about how to interpret the law and when to change it. For example, the Constitution is a law that tells us how to make a new federal statute. And finally, the rule of law is a matter of culture. In a culture with a strong respect for the rule of law, we expect officials to decide according to law. We expect that judges and bureaucrats pay, faced with a particular case will decide it the way the law says, not based on bribes or personal connections. In some cultures, the expectation is the other way around. 
that you get what you want by paying a bribe or by knowing the right person. But respect for the law isn't just a matter of what we expect officials to do. In a culture with a strong respect for the rule of law, private persons also tend to do what the law commands and not what the law forbids. Living in a society with the rule of law contributes to an individual's survival and flourishing and is therefore a value on objectivist premises because it takes the rule of law to make our rights secure. In such a society, the law provides a scheme of legal rights that we can rely on. That means that if we stay within our legal rights, we're safe. Safe from the government because it will respect our legal rights and safe from everyone else because they know that if they violate our legal rights, the government will come after them. To use a phrase that was inscribed in gilt letters in my law school, the known certainty of the law is the safety of all. Of course, to get the best advantage from the security of these legal rights, we need those rights to match the philosophical principles of rights. But the philosophical principles of rights can't do their job without the specificity and predictability they get from being embodied in law. The point of rights is to protect our ability to live, act, acquire values, pursue happiness, and to do that, those principles, those rights need to be predictable. We need to know what we are free to do. And that means that rights principles can only be implemented in the context of the rule of law. Importantly, the known certainty of the law provides safety even against government. When government is constrained by the rule of law, an official who, for whatever reason, wants to hurt us or take what is ours is limited by law. How much that protects us depends on what the law actually says. It is significant that Magna Carta did not immediately work, that for centuries kings tried to work against it. And our own Constitution no longer limits our government nearly as much as it used to, let alone as much as objectivism says a Constitution should. As the framers understood, limiting government is an engineering problem, a problem of constructing a system in which individuals in different offices will be able to limit one another and the state. And that is a difficult task that has not been fully solved. And yet, for all these difficulties, Magna Carta stands for the idea that there is such a thing as law, and it is, in some real and important sense, over the government. And there is a reality to that, a reality that is valuable. In January 1999, when President Clinton was facing possible removal from office, there were no tanks in the street, no unusual police presence. There was no reason to doubt that if the Senate vote had gone against him, the most powerful human being on the face of the earth would have walked away, because the law said so. We take that for granted, but it is not universal, either historically or today. The impeachment of a president is a rare occasion, but every single day, we expect the courts to stand up to presidents, to prosecutors, to police, and to tell them no. Indeed, we expect ourselves to be able to say no to officials. And we expect that if the law is on our side, we will win, no matter who is against us. We expect that to have a legal right means something, that our legal rights are not mere words on paper, but are genuine law that can protect us against any power in the land. This is the value Magna Carta represents. This is the value those who fought for it and in its tradition created over the centuries. What is Magna Carta? Why are these Latin words on this medieval parchment worth celebrating in America today? Most importantly, Magna Carta is a symbol. In an era where the government often tries to scare us into submission, when getting on a plane requires submission to the TSA, when prosecutors bully defendants into pleading guilty, Magna Carta 
stands for the ideal of liberty in law. It stands for the principle that our legal rights must and will protect us against officials. That we as free citizens are not helpless before anyone. That we need not live in fear. That the law offers us security, even against those who make and enforce it. What is the meaning of Magna Carta? Magna Carta stands for a homeowner standing in his doorway, telling the police to go away or come back with a warrant. And the police, knowing that the law is on his side, and they must leave. Magna Carta stands for an alleged criminal telling the prosecution to go ahead and prove it, and the jury acquitting her without fear. Magna Carta stands for an aspiring lawyer knowing that if he wants to win cases, he had better learn to, the law and learn how to argue it, and not just make friends with powerful people. Magna Carta means the taxpayers debating whether they're paying too much in taxes. Magna Carta stands for a voice coming over the school loudspeaker, speaking of liberty and justice for all. And Magna Carta stands for a student invoking the First Amendment and saying, no, I won't salute the flag. Every time a citizen looks a cop or a bureaucrat or a high elected official in the eye and says no, with the confidence that he will prevail because the law is on his side, he is standing on the tradition of Magna Carta. Thank you. Okay, I have just given a lecture on law in front of two law professors, and one of them is getting up to ask me a question. He's even a legal historian. <laughs> okay, um, I somewhat recall other countries shortly after the Magna Carta in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries signing similar documents or creating similar systems. I believe Spain had something similar. Poland created the Commonwealth and elected monarchy. So how come those systems didn't, or those documents or systems, create a long legacy of liberty like England's Magna Carta did? Um, I don't know much about other countries' systems. Um, so I really can't say uh, whether other countries have succeeded um, with their own traditions at doing the same thing uh, that Magna Carta and what came out of it did in the Anglo-American tradition. Um, I've noticed that the idea, uh, the, the stereotype, if you will, that France operated on the premise that the law was in the mouth of the king is somewhat borne out by the fact that when the people replaced the king, they saw themselves as having unlimited authority um, and went rather wild with that authority. Um, in ways that are very much alien to our tradition. But I can't really make a case uh, that our tradition is superior to any other without studying the other traditions uh, in order to be able to make a comparison. Um, I will say that common lawyers have traditionally taken the view, uh, that is, lawyers in the Anglo-American tradition have traditionally taken the view that the civil law tradition prevailing um, on the continent of Europe and in countries that derive their legal heritage uh, from the continent of Europe um, empowers arbitrary government. That's been the traditional view among common lawyers. Whether they're right, I can't speak to. Hi, Alexander. First, I want to thank you for talking so much about English history today, because I've always thought that uh, uh, so much of our law and our legal system uh, owes much to the English heritage, and yet the average American is so ignorant of English history, and that includes law students and law professors, too. So I think it's great that you remind us of the importance of English history, Thank you. Uh, not only in connection with Magna Carta, but in other respects, too. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the famous Clause 39. Magna Carta and the reference to the law of the land. Uh, there's been a, 
long-going debate among constitutional scholars in America about so-called substantive versus procedural due process uh, left liberal scholars in the early 20th century, conservative scholars in the late 20th century have argued uh, due process really means just following the proper procedures and not the substantive application of the law, not to apply the law to deprive someone of life, liberty, or property where the law does not substantively allow the government to do so. It's always seemed to me that what King John was promising in Clause 39 is not simply to follow the proper procedures, but not to deprive any of his subjects of life, liberty, or property, where the law of the land does not permit him as king to do so. So it's always had a substantive as well as a procedural uh, meaning. Um, do you agree? And uh, if that's so, is this modern debate and this artificial distinction that some scholars draw perhaps uh, a result of our relative ignorance about Magna Carta? I think one thing that is often, and this is going to be a somewhat oblique answer, uh, not really a direct answer, but um, I don't really have a direct answer on tap free, so I'm going to say something related. And that is that people arguing about whether we need more than just a procedural due process, undervalue procedure as a safeguard against substantive wrongs. Consider, if we take the, the idea of procedural due process very, very strictly, we disempower the bureaucrats tremendously in as much as, you know, if we insist that due process means laws have to be made by the legislature with representation and individual cases have to be decided by real courts. In the case of the federal government, Article III courts with everything that that implies, such as life tenure for judges. And anything that's punitive has to be handled by a jury. Put in those procedural safeguards and a lot of your substantive abuses get very seriously checked. Partly simply because how much you know, mischief can Congress do if it has to do it all itself? And partly because of the systems of accountability that are in place in the case of the legislature and the system of jury trial um, in the courts. So even if we only say that the procedures have to be proper, there is an awful lot of protection that comes from that um, if we're really serious about uh, what I would call strong procedural due process. That said, um, is the law of the land clause uh, putting substantive limits on what the law can say? I myself am not sure, but it is al already important to have the idea that the law has to actually say it. Hi, I thought this was a terrific presentation. Well, thank you, Professor. And, and a terrific answer on the importance of process. We can have a long conversation about that, hopefully at 5.15 when I come back. Uh, but I want to ask a completely unfair question because it's somewhat off your topic, but here goes. Uh, back in 1215, when the barons confronted the king, barons had quite an army behind them, and, and that surely had something to do with the king's decision. I thought it was very interesting that you pointed out four and a half centuries later, when you come to 1688, there is no war. Uh, a century later, the United States Constitution is adopted over the screams of anti-federalists who thought it was reintroducing tyranny, monarchy, everything that they had just bled and fought for. 
no war. If there had been, there's no question that the Anti-Federalists would have won that war, uh, I, I don't think, but they swore oaths to the Constitution that they just spent months screaming about. Um, the question is, if there was no threat in 1688 of a war, what would the world have looked like? If the balance of forces a century later had been different, what would the Constitution have looked like? How much does all of this happen in the shadow of the threat of revolution? Maybe an unanswerable question, yeah. but it's <laughs> one that it, 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 you go back 800 years and yeah, there are the armies. You don't see the armies lined up. How important is it that they might? Well, I mean, you, you see them lined up on the 17th century with Cromwell versus Charles right. I. I'm talking about 1688. By the time you but, get to there, it's by the, a, by you the know. time, by the time of, of 1688, um, I would guess the reason there is no war is that it was clear who would win. Um, that the um, now, to what extent is everything in the shadow of the threat of revolution? I would say everything is in, is in the shadow of the idea that there is some means of enforcing the law. What that means is, whether it is revolutionary, um, whether it is that the military has swung into place behind the legislature, whether it is, I mean, think about what would have happened if Bill Clinton had been convicted by the Senate and said, well, too bad, ha ha, I'm staying in the White House. Every cop, every secret service agent, <laughs> he would have had as much luck uh, as I would have if I got evicted and tried not to leave. Uh, my apartment. Um, does that ultimately mean force? Well, yeah, I, su I suppose, but you know, the Secret Service coming and arresting the guy or something, you know, or the, some relevant police saying, hey, Mr. Clinton, you're under arrest for trespassing in the White House. Um, doesn't look an awful lot like revolution. Um, now, did the founders think that the threat of revolution was significant? I would say so. We have Mr. Jefferson on watering the tree of liberty. We have the Second Amendment, which does not exist to protect our right to hunt ducks. Um, So, you know, on the other hand, uh, there was no need to think about would the people rise to remove President Clinton because the, you know, the authority of Congress was taken for granted. And any force that might have been necessary would have just been, you know, there, there would have been no possibility of resisting. Well, thank you.